Jeremy's sculpture doing the golden boots. Your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long 
they celebrate your righteousness. Please stand as we get them.
us. You put it on because you love us. You put it on because you want to identify with us. Because you want to, you want to walk with us. You want to come down and reach down to us. Because we are so unable to reach out to you. We are so unable to, to obtain you, to get to you, Father. Lord, we thank you today for that incredible love. We thank you, Father, that it's the love that we can celebrate, Lord. It is a love that is unbreakable. It is agape love. It is love that, that, that is sacrificial, Father. Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Lord, let us live in that love. As your word says, continue ye in my love. As I have loved you, so you love one another. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, teach us to love one another. Jesus, Jesus. The word tells us by this, all people know that you're my disciples when you love one another. Let us learn that love. Let us replicate the love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Take your seats with you just for a moment. Who was here last night? Let's have a show of hands. Who was here? But how did we have a great time last night? Oh, wasn't it fantastic? We had a, an amazing time. The youth did so well. That that uh, wonderful uh, song that Diane brought has been. I have had so many comments about that. I really have. It's absolutely amazing. We were so blessed. So thank you to everybody who came out. Thank you to everybody who supported uh, the carol service last night. It was a wonderful time. Um, of course, Christmas is soon upon us. We have, uh, I've got all these carol service leaflets here. If anybody wants them, you know, maybe you can write on the back or draw a picture or something like that. They're, they're not much use now, but um, maybe we can just scribble the date out and use them again next year. I'm not sure, but uh, it was great. It was really, really good. Uh, of course, we are here on Christmas morning for our Christmas Day service, and we're meeting at ten, ten, half past ten. We're doing half past ten. We're doing half past ten on Christmas morning. So I had to look at Karen because we often do ten o'clock on Christmas morning, but we're doing ten thirty Christmas morning just for an hour. Please do come. We're going to be uh, worshiping the Lord and. Uh, we encourage all the kids and the adults to bring a present, bring something to, to show everybody. We'll do a bit of a bit of a bring and share, and or or, or show and tell rather, not bring and share. We're not gonna, we're not kids. We're not gonna be giving other people your presents. Don't worry, it's okay. You can keep them. But um, well, please do join us on Christmas morning, and then on New Year's Day, a week afterwards, on New Year's Day, we'll be meeting here at eleven o'clock. On New Year's Day. Again, that will be about an hour, very relaxed service. We're going to be doing uh, bacon rolls and, and uh, uh, we've got some sausages as well. There'll be sausage sandwiches, bacon rolls, and um, the vegan option will be rolls. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, no, we will, we, we will do some, some a vegan option of sorts. But uh, uh, please do come and join us on New Year's Day. Okay, is that okay? Let's stand together.
Christmas, everyone. Um, this wasn't planned, but I just wanted to say before I started this, um, thank you to everyone for welcoming, welcoming us to the church as a family. Um, we felt so loved and accepted, and we're just really grateful for your kindness. Um, now, as the most Christ-like member of our family, it was voted on. I'll be like some big family next week. When I saw the length of the reading, I very graciously swapped on my wife. Um, <laughs> that wasn't um, going to be it, though, wasn't it? Right. No, I am actually really spiritual. I tell the boys all the time that uh, I even know what God's got Jesus for Christmas because I, I felt his presence. <laughs> but, um, right. The fourth candle we are lighting today represents peace, sometimes known as the angel candle. As we look around us, we can see that we need peace in our lives more than ever. We pray for peace in Ukraine and in all the places of conflict around the world. We pray for peace in our lives and in the lives of our friends and families too. Luke 2 verse 14 says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. Well, thank you, Pete. Let's stand together now. Our younger children are going to go out a little bit early this week. Uh, they have some kind of Christmas bonanza <laughs> planned. I'm not quite sure, but it looks a lot of fun. I might go out myself, actually. <laughs> I'm not preaching today. I can I can up there. It's, it's okay. No, let's stand together. We're going to pray. Let's pray for our kids today. Uh, you, you stay here for a little bit. Hannah's going to take the youth out. Uh, in a few minutes, but um, let's pray for our kids. Father, we thank you for our children, we thank you for our children's workers, we thank you, Lord, for all of those who invest their time and their effort and their energy into the lives of our young people. Lord, we pray today that each one of them will be drawn closer to you through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>
that we can we can live in your presence daily. That we can know you daily. The Lord, we can come into this place and lift up your name, but also, Lord, in our day-to-day lives, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we can lift up your name just the same. We can lift up your name in our workplaces, in our colleges, in our schools. We can lift up your name with our neighbors, our friends, and our families. Lord, there there are no restrictions on lifting up your name, on worshiping you. There are no restrictions on glorifying you. Father, today, we thank you that that is who you are to us. You are Emmanuel. You are God with us. And Lord, you are reflected in our lives. You are Lord, you are shown in our lives. Worship you, God. Shut up.
and take it in your own time. You can stand here and take it. You can take it back to your seat. There are no rules. There are no regulations on this. Just come and share in the Lord's Supper today. It's well known that I like the book of Isaiah. One of the main reasons I like the book of Isaiah is because, as I said last night at the carol service, it was written so many years before Jesus came, yet it speaks so eloquently of who he is. Not who he was, but who he is. And what he accomplished when he was here on earth. And of course, we read from that, uh, those verses in Isaiah chapter 9, talk about that the government should be upon his shoulders and he should be called wonderful counselor, the prince of peace. But this morning as we gather around this table, I want to read from Isaiah 53, which says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised, he was rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. We held him in low speed, and surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we have been healed. Let's just come and share this together. For the last time in 2022, let's come together and share in this wonderful communion meal. Please just come whenever you're ready.
Please take a seat. How are we all doing? Happy Christmas. Are you all well? Yes. Are you excited for Christmas? Any teachers have we got in the room? Yeah, freedom. At least for a short period of time, anyway. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. At least they live in They did like Braveheart, actually. Yeah. Great Australian Scotsman. So Mark's asked me to speak on, um, well, I'll, actually, I'll, tell, I'll go back a little bit further. We had a conversation with Corrie last week, and we, because we're going through a series of spiritual gifts. And I said to Mark, what do you want me to speak on? Said, Face, healing, miracles, discernment, discernment, what do you speak on discernment? I thought it's probably the one he doesn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's your favourite one. Yeah, very discerning. And, um, and so I thought, right, how do you, how do you do discernment and the Christmas story together? Um, so, actually there's a lot in there, so I've been playing with that one. But I'm going to be speaking on discernment this morning. And before I jump into it, here's the actual <laughs> question. What is the difference between the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, and the gift of discernment? It's actually hotly debated in theology as well. So it's not an easy topic to brush over and to just go, oh, here's the clean line to between them. But there are some clues from Scripture which we can rattle through. And I'll try my best to read some verses, although my eyesight is so bad and the light is so poor at the moment, I cannot actually read the text. Um, and so um, you'll find in 1 Kings chapter 3 um, a series of. <laughs> and there was um, chapter, chapter 3 verse 6 Then Solomon said You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David my father according to as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of, of heart towards you and you have uh, reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on the throne, as in this day. Now, O Lord God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am a little child. I do not know how to go out and come in. Your servant in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people, who are too many to be numbered and counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. Solomon prays as a young child. Not give me wisdom so that I may write the book of Proverbs. He prays for a discerning heart <coughs> that is able to understand what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. I've grown up in, in church environments and much of my time in church environments has been around the charismatic church. For those of you who are familiar with the charismatic church, they're the ones that swing from the chandeliers and clap their hands and dance. <laughs> Often described as the charismaniacs, or the crazy apostles. <coughs> and um, among the Pentecostals plenty are, um, are a group of people that have a strong sense that the greatest hits of God were not 2,000 years ago and written into the history books, but actually the, the God who is here and now, the God who is living and active, the God who is busy in every street, in every home, in every church, in every heart, the God who lives on from Acts 2 and didn't park the bus in Acts 1 when they were having Bible studies and prayer meetings, but whose spirit was born on the flesh. And so as a consequence, um, as, a, as a Christian, growing up in a Pentecostal church, um, not saying that Pentecostals have got it all right, because of course we haven't, but who have this strong awareness that God is at work in today, we hunger after what God is doing, that we may be part of what he is doing. We hunger after God that we may experience his presence. And we hunger after God that we may see his good 
works and his miracles and his amazing grace in the world that we live in today. That is essential to the heart of the upbringing that I've had. And so as a consequence, I remember even as a young child, um, with some of the scriptures that I've just read out, thinking to myself, God, give me wisdom. God, give me discernment of spirit. God, give me the gift of tongues. God, give me an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And my earliest encounter with God was probably around the age of five and six. Um, and I think I told you the story when Uncle Alfie, God bless him, at Fraser Camp in Eden, decided to have a meeting with um, the kids that were just in the children's work um, and asked them to pray for one another that they may encounter God. And there was an outpouring of God's Spirit in that meeting. And so that encounter with God for me has set the scene for me of, of a journey of trying to figure it out and run my way through as I go along, marrying up what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, with my expectations and what I read in the Bible, with the theological frameworks that I do or don't have, um, and, and how well I can interpret the scriptures and that whole throw all the way through. And so in this context, Solomon is a child living in the time of David, who has set up David's tabernacle, the worship, and the, the closeness to God, whose heart hungers after God. So David is looking at relationship with God rather than just services and um, temple and uh, ritual. And in that, Solomon is speaking to God one to one. How unusual. And he asks of God that he may have his own heart for the purposes of leading the people well. Not for the purposes of being famous for writing a book in the Bible. Not for the purposes of great wealth, even though God says he'll bless him with great wealth in the, in the verses afterwards. But simply for the purpose that he may be well. And he asks for discernment so that he may help others prosper around him. And that he, he may take the position God has given him and use it for his glory. And in order to do that, he needs to know the difference between good and evil. So 1 Kings 3. Discernment gives you the ability to judge between good and evil. I'll play it through, you don't have to keep flipping through the scriptures. Ezekiel um, 44, verse 23, talks about the gift of discernment enabling you to understand the difference between what is holy and what is profane. The word profanity actually in, in, in the Hebrew means to approach the threshold, not necessarily just to cross it. And um, so profanity is to just skirt the edge, not just step over the line. And so to remain holy, therefore, it means to avoid the edge of the cliff, not just walk along the edge of it and not fall off. Yeah. So um, I think it's John Glass's book that says, better to have a fence at the top of the cliff than an ambulance at the bottom. And um, the, the illustration there between holy and profane is the illustration of making sure that you stay clear of the edge. That would be holiness. But interestingly, and I'll translate this slightly different later, what is holiness is a jolly question. Often in our Christian circles, we define holiness by what we don't do, not by what we do. And yet, everything of God in His holiness is defined by who He is, not by who He isn't. So, I'm, I'm taking you through a journey of thought which is almost a life journey for me as I'm going, so I might relate some of this to personal stories I go through. 1 Corinthians 2 talks about how um, we are, the, the, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to discern God. In other words, it says that it's impossible to discern God without the assistance or the leading of the Holy Spirit. We translate that in our theological frames when we talk about salvation, that it's the Holy Spirit that leads a person to Christ. How often do we think it's us? <laughs> He's the Savior, right? And so when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my friend is light, it doesn't mean that we have to live as Christians and their salvation is totally dependent on me. You help. <laughs> but it is totally dependent on you, the Holy Spirit. Likewise, when we start talking about the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how do you discern what God is doing? Do you discern what God is doing because you know 
everything that is written? Do you discern what God is doing because he always does my interpretation of those verses? Or do you discern what God is doing because of the leading of the Holy Spirit? And how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and now we start stepping into all sorts of strange territory. Because what is God doing? That's a jolly good question. Now, I just brought you back to some of my thinking that as Pentecostals, we believe that God is living and active right now. He's moving in every home, in every street, in every church. So often we pray for revival that he might do that. But God always said to me, live as if I am. Living in revival, but he didn't say living in revival, but he just said live as if I am. Because he is, and he doesn't change. So I don't have to see fire upon the rooftop like they saw in the Rizusa Street before I believe God's moving in a community. And I don't have to see the masses get saved before I believe God's already at work in a community. So now the question, what is God doing, is a really interesting question. God give us discernment that we might see what you are doing. That we might know where you are at work. That we might distinguish between what is holy and what is profane in the homes and communities and the streets, in the words that come from, from, from leaders and the councils and leaders and the politicians and when Rishi Sunak in the midst of the COVID crisis said now is the time for the economics of compassion. God help me to see what you are doing there. Because that, that let me just, let me just, that phrase does not come from evil. That phrase might have been said by somebody that doesn't know Jesus, might have been said from a position of power and authority that doesn't represent what we describe as the institution of the church, may not have been inspired by the opponent from the Archbishop of Canterbury, but those words resonate with a holiness that only finds its root in God. Therefore, in the midst of the COVID crisis, in Parliament, at the very senior levels of power in our country, the Holy Spirit was at work to inspire an heart. He's now our Prime Minister. What is he doing? What is, what is God doing? Malcolm mentioned last week, the sons of Israel, the people that understand the times and knew what to do. He, 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 he interpreted that within the framework of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. Understanding the times, knowledge, and knowing what to do, the wisdom, and the irony of the two back to front. But that's why it's so hard to understand the difference between these three, right? That we intertwine these words so easily. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 talks about testing the spirits because there are many false prophets who would lead many astray. The gift of discernment then applying to knowing when a spiritual leader, even a church leader, says something or acts in a certain way or lives a certain way or preaches in a certain way that leads people astray from the truths of the Bible and from the person of Jesus Christ, who should be one and the same. Yeah, I was, I was speaking with Jeremy yesterday, and we were having a deep theological discussion over coffee in the kitchen. And um, we were talking about how word must become flesh. How Jesus said he was the fulfillment of the law. But that actually theological truths find their identity in the person of Christ. And that's why Jesus can stand before some Pilate and say, I am truth. Yeah. I am truth. Right, get on to the story, Gary, because this is getting a little boring. <laughs> Matthew 2. Matthew 2 has the story of the Magi on their way to Jerusalem because they have seen in the stars Jesus. The Messiah was born in Bethlehem. 
Anyone who's a better can get is following the star. It's interesting, a few years ago they had um, a new large book that was on the nativity star that could be seen in the sky. And um, it was where Jupiter was in the right, I think it was in Aries. And Aries is the, the lamb. Somebody can tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure none of you know. Because um, you're very Pentecostal, so you wouldn't even think about knowing about the stars, right? And um, it was also with, I think it was with, so Jupiter is the king, and then I think it was with Venus is there as well. And so it was a constellation combination that in ancient mysticism would have taught them that a king had been born in the constellation of Aries being the constellation of the Jewish nation, and therefore they were to go to the Jewish nation because a new king had been born. That's something like that, right? You're welcome to Google it, there's probably about 15 million pages of speaking all sorts of tribe that will teach you all sorts of silliness about that one. The bottom line is none of us know. Yeah, the traditional thing is the star is on top of the tree somewhere, there he goes on there, and we just follow the star and it keeps moving. I have this image in my head, we keep moving around and you kind of keep following the star, a bit like the kind of Holy Ghost hat now, and it stops right above both days of the Mary. And I have this in my head, that could be true, quite happy with that one. Um, but the, the idea is this, very simply, when you read the text in Matthew, you see this moment, they turn up in Jerusalem, and they say, where's Herod, because obviously he's the king, he must have had a new son, and um, they say, the Messiah has been born. <laughs> and it says that all Jerusalem were talking about it, because nobody had seen it coming. Nobody. Now, they had all the knowledge. They had the Old Testament. With all of the prophecies, including the ones that Mark has been reading from the prophet Isaiah. The oldest scroll that we've got is from 200 BC. You can go to Jerusalem and see the scroll in its entirety from the book of Isaiah. And so what's really cool is we've got an original scroll from 200 BC that records the stuff that's read out in these chapters and speaks of the birth of Jesus Christ. And this scroll is 200 years older than when Jesus came. So we've actually got a scroll from before it happened, talking about the birth of Jesus. So they had that, they had those scrolls. They had stuff that said that he should be born in Bethlehem. That he was named would be one of the council of God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, and the increase in his government, and that there will be no end. And the government will be on his shoulders, and they have all this stuff. And then they didn't see this coming. And yet, these folks, we call them three, these folks from the east, in the stars, saw the coming of the Messiah. They were looking to the stars to find out what God was doing. Right? That doesn't mean suddenly we have to all go out and get our horoscopes. <laughs> so, see where you can go with this stuff? Right? Discernment's really important. <laughs> you get it, right? Discernment matters because, okay, let's just segue, please sidetrack. You can tell I haven't had much prep time this week. <laughs> Oh, uh, was it Jeff, Jeff Lucas? Jeff Lucas, anybody know who Jeff Lucas? He has, he's a funny guy, so he's actually worth listening to. He's probably some Google stuff on YouTube you can listen to. He tells some really funny stories. He tells the story of going to a church. And he went to this church, and he says, right, let's all get our Bibles out, we're going to probably, we're going to read the Bible. And then everybody picks up a plastic sword and waves it over their heads in the church congregation. Imagine going to that church, right? How well would you feel, right? Um, and plastic sword, I'm waving the sword. Plastic sword being a visitor to the plastic sword away. Why are we waving swords? A while previously, years previously, somebody brought a plastic sword to church because they felt God told them to bring a plastic sword to church. Probably had a five year old. My kids have done it before. But yeah. <laughs> plastic sword to church. It wasn't a five year old. It was to do with when the pastor said he was going to read the reading, they were to wave their plastic sword in the air. And then there was a moment in the church congregation where God did stuff, right? I'm not going to say what, because stuff is such a useful term in the Christian circles to describe, I've got no idea what God's doing, but he's clearly at work, right? So God did stuff. And because of that moment, the entire congregation had decided it would be a good idea that every time the pastor wants to open the Bible, they would all bring a plastic sword 
all along. And they would all wave it above their heads just in case God would visit again and he needs to do it this way. They turn, you turn it into religious rituals. Whereas discernment would tell you that that was a one off. Yeah. <laughs> How needed is the gift of discernment in the charismatic challenge? <laughs> because this, let me bomb it down on something. And I thought the car on the way It's great, man. Brett, Gareth, come on. Sorry, you don't pay me. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do so many jobs. <laughs> anyway, what was my thought? Going back to the world. Okay, yes, the thought. The thought is this, okay? The gift of discernment depends on two things. It depends on one, we just outlined, that you believe that God is at work everywhere. You need that to have the gift of discernment. And also, that the enemy is at work. Now there's something to distinguish between the two. There's a plus and a minus. Okay, there's a red and a blue. There's a good and an evil. I've got to know, I've got to use the gift of discernment to know the difference between these two. That's the first thing that you need. The second thing you need is a really good idea of who Jesus is. Discernment is not a gift that is easily used with those who are new in the church. It's not that you're excluded, I've seen God do it. But the more that you know Jesus, the more you know the authentic. And the more you know the authentic, you, the more you can spot the counterfeit. So, one of the things that I can encourage you to do today is not, although systematic theology is good, not really systematic theology, is to read about Jesus Christ. It's something I was asked a few weeks ago when somebody interviewed me on homelessness, and they said, what well, one thing do you wish that the, the nation would do? And I said, I wish the nation would revisit the person of Jesus Christ and look in him for the character and the integrity of what it means to be a person in this nation and to live a civilized life. And we're talking about it because of the judgments that are made in our homeless, the judgments that are made on people that have found themselves in difficulty, and as a culture we are habitually doing it. We do it as Christians too, right? But revisit the person of Jesus Christ. As, as many, I think I've used this before, as a medic, when you're learning um, in medical school, you're taught normal, 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 normal. For years, you've learned normal. It's so boring. Um, normal ECG, normal X-ray, normal full X-ray, normal chest X-ray, normal, normal CT scans, normal this, normal this, normal this. How do they do it? How do they, how do, they do the X-rays? How does the systems work? What angles do they use? All those sorts of things. Normal, 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 normal. And you get so fed up with normal. And then what happens is you hit the wards, and as soon as you hit the wards, a consultant will pick up a chest, a chest radiograph, a chest radiograph, and for those of you who are medics, you understand the difference. An x-ray is what goes through, you and radiograph is the picture. So if you ever find yourself with a consultant who says, what's that? You say it's a chest radiograph, not a chest x-ray. If you say it's a chest x-ray, they say, no, that's what goes through a person, not a picture. Of anyway, semantics. A chest radiograph goes up, and as soon as the chest radiograph comes up, you go, hang on, so they're not quite right there. That's a problem. And you put your finger on the bit, you're not supposed to touch them. You put your finger on the bit, <laughs> but it's wrong. I know normal. And because I know normal, and because I have a strong idea of who the person of Jesus Christ is, and the way he loved, and the way he interacted, and the way he served, and the way he knelt, and the way he came alongside, and the way he got down in the dirt, yeah. I know the inauthentic. I know the counterfeit, I know what's wrong with the image, with the radiograph. I can see where the tumour is, where the infection is, where the, where the pieces are missing, where the brick is, or the spine is on. I can see where the issues are because I know it's normal. I may not be able to define them, I may not be able to tell you exactly what's causing them, I may not be able to kind of get you all the way down into the details to get to the number of the root there, but I can certainly go down that investigation process and immediately I know where the issues are 
or what the issue is. The ability to define between the holy and the profane. So the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the belief that God is at work everywhere. Here's where it gets interesting for me, and this is my thought in the car. Oh, you took me around that way, Gareth. But I thought in the car on the way here. Either God is at work in the community, and it doesn't matter what you do. That's, that's what some people actually believe as Christians. So therefore, because nothing is dependent on you, you don't have to do anything. God's going to sort it away. So, whatever happens in the world, so long as we look after ourselves in here, and stay holy, look busy, Jesus is coming, and, and that whole world, so long as, so long as we do that, we're alright. And then whatever goes on in the world, it's God's fault. It's a bit like parenting, isn't it? It's pretty challenging. When, we were just joking about this earlier, when, when you've got a child, you're kind of going to choose to do it their way anyway. And you kind of have to trust God with them. So there's this bit of you that's trusting God with them, but there's also this bit of you that's saying, but I'm still supposed to be a parent. So how do I find the middle ground here, right? So, um, how do I find, but you know, you get it wrong every day, don't you? You're never quite sure. So you, I'm, I'm yet to experience this fully. I know, I know, I'm talking about my children. Sorry, Sonia. I'm yet to experience this fully. But there's a moment where you go, do you know what? I, I really have got no idea what I'm doing as a parent, but somehow it works out. But that's where we've been actively involved and God's been actively involved, and so there's this man in between the two. Because often in the Christian world, we've got this idea that either God's at work, it doesn't matter what we do, or it's totally dependent on us. And so if I don't do this, if I don't go out and preach, if I don't go out and share my faith, if I don't go out there, all going to hell and it's all going to be my fault. And I'll stand before God on judgment day and he'll say, why don't you do it? Look at all those people going to hell because of you. <laughs> the truth is, it's not one or the other, it's both and. Because if it was all dependent on you, your Christian spirituality and use of the spiritual gifts would look something like this. I have to understand the spiritual gifts so well that I get God to do what I think he should be doing by my manipulation of the spirit. Of course, we don't do that, do we? Put an order on the doorposts to make sure that the evil spirits can't get through the room. <laughs> <laughs> As if the name of Jesus isn't enough. Reading books on how to get demons out of people by using cloth or leaves or smoke or knowing what the name of the thing is. I know what the name of the Lord is. I don't need to know his name. <laughs> I need to know his name. Right? Friends, the name of Jesus is always enough. He's God. You don't need your talents, gifts, and abilities. You need his. That's what the spiritual gifts are. I go in my weakness. He brings his strength. I have my name. I have his name. Who's his more powerful name? Who is the devil afraid of? You or him? Who flees? It's the demons flee. Because of his name. So the name of Jesus is always enough. I was taught that by somebody, and I'm passing that one on to you. The name of Jesus is always enough. So, either... Sorry, I was over here. This is this belief system over here. Either... Either it's all dependent on me. Therefore, it's up to me as a Christian to know more to be wiser, so that I may manipulate the Spirit of God to do what He wants to do in this community. That's not the way it works, right? We don't have some sort of Christian spiritualism where we've got various power of our fingertips. And we just have to put the right code in to get the result. <coughs> it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And I need to be told that regularly as well. It's Jesus. He's enough. 
This is about Jesus, not about my brilliance and spirituality. This is about Jesus, not about my position or my status. It's just Jesus. It's just him. He does it. The flip side is that he does it all. I don't have to do anything. So what's the point of the church? If it's all up to God and not up to any of us, why bother doing anything? Let's just close the doors, have holy huddles, eat, eat great mince pies, have a lovely coffee, and let the world go to hell because it's God's fault. Of course it's not, because something's going on in us. I once heard a, a, a speaker say it this way. He said, God, God needs us. Not because he needs us, but because we need to be needed. And so we step into this middle ground which is messy and difficult. But we've got to discern what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what's going on in the world. We've got to see, like the Magi, looking into the world, <coughs> their world was the stars, looking into the world to discern where the Messiah is moving, where the Spirit of God is moving, and go there. That we might celebrate and bring what we can to honour and to compliment and come alongside and serve. That is the calling of a Christian who is filled with the Spirit, anointed with his gifts, to go in our weakness, in his strength, to the places that he is already at work, that he's shown us the discernment is needed to know where to go. On a slide on track. I once, um, when I was pastoring in Scotland, took on a, a, a building Probably heard some of you have heard the story. I managed to get a thing for the insurance company to give me a building free. It was a pound a year. It was a 55,000 square foot building on 12 acres of land with 280 car parking spaces. Now, this is for a church, we have about 50, 60 people, and we um, didn't have much money, but we had no money. And the building had come kind of all day. So, God gave us this building for free. It was amazing. It was and then, and then I thought, right, can't just use this for me. Gotta find a way to best the community for this. Because when God feeds 5,000 and gives you a basket, how many do you feed with this? Right? The principles start to sink in, these are work everywhere, right? So how what else is God doing that I might come alongside? A couple of really interesting experiences. Um, we went out to the press and we had 50 different charities that I showed around in two days because we were giving them free space and we were joining in, in the club and that's changed the world for Jesus. But they didn't know Jesus, so that's just changed the world. And they knew, they, they knew why I was doing it, and they were coming on the side, so it was great. Anyway, long story short, I had some witches come along now. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, I'll tell you this, I don't, I don't know why I showed you, right? And these witches come along. And they think they, 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 we're witches. Oh, hello, nice to meet you. I'm Gareth, I'm a minister. I was expecting some sort of burning to take place, or, or some sort of power to break out, but there wasn't a lot. So, um, so I just wandered them around the building, because I was taking everybody around the building, so I wandered them around the building, and I said, well, you know, what do you, what do you want? What do you want to take some space in here for? Oh, we like the middle. We were thinking of doing some rituals in the middle. <laughs> okay. Uh, church service, chicken beheading. Um, <laughs> this is church ministry, right? And God gave me the gift of the seven. <laughs> this one probably isn't going to work. They also said there's some forest nearby, but I'm wondering if there's any clearings. So we can go in the forest at midnight and go and do things on the old Lord help me. What is going on? Anyway, I checked the ground and I said, well, it's probably not going to work. Just there might be a little bit of conflict. <sighs> not. Um, and that's where we planted the our Easter egg hunts anyway in the middle there. And, you know, <laughs> The head of chicken. Just <laughs> anyway, he said to me, so can we pray for you? Would you like which pray for you? What? I thought this was an opportunity. I said, I'll let you do it if you let me pray for you. I said, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> so they were doing um, Mother Goddess, is what they were doing, but there's no Mother Goddess, just I'm not going to preach that from a platform, right? They're doing all of this kind of moving around and shaking. And it got to me. And I stood there with my hand in the pocket like this. 
And I say it in the name that is above every name. In the name of the creator of heaven and earth. In the name of the one who spoke into being all things and formed with his hands, flesh itself. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you that you would find peace and hope and life and purpose in your creator. And I just started to pray. When they didn't start shaking, making or flying around the room, which is, you know, part of me is grateful for anyway, because I'm not sure which way around that would be. But I thought, discern. Not only can I discern between good and evil here, but I can discern between an opportunity and a non opportunity. And I knew that if I said no to them, they wouldn't let me pray for them. So I let them pray for me, saying, Oh Lord, protect me from whatever it is we're doing it, you know. Doing what we do is on the cross, you know, because that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> no. But just taking authority in the name of Jesus and just praying over their lives because I thought, when's the next chance that they hear a Christian prayer again instead of just rejecting them and saying they've got one? Don't, right? So, God wants to save everybody, God's everywhere, how much time have I got? No idea. Somebody tell me. Right, second story. What was the other? Was the other story? Right. So while I was wandering people around and showing people, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I had um, okay, two stories. Um, I had um, I had two guys come here, in really nice suits. One of them in a, a deep grey long jacket, um, it's cold and dundee, scarf and everything else. <laughs> and then another one in a you know big black suit, big guy, bigger than Mark, big guy. <laughs> Like the Terminator, right? <laughs> and the Terminator guy did all the talking. And the, the other guy in, in the grey suit said nothing except at the very end. And they're walking around saying, Oh, what's going on in this okay, what's going on around here? Now as I'm walking around, I'm thinking, these guys are gangsters. <laughs> they want to know what we're doing, they want to know why we're doing it, they want to know we're making money off it. Well, I mean, like these guys are scary, like walking around, and, and it got to the end, and the guy in the black suit, shut up, and the guy in the grey suit put his hand out, and he just said, right, what are you doing, carry on, and they left, I thought, I'm all right there. Two weeks later, I very recently I connected these two together, two weeks later a guy called Bruce Linton turned up, I think I mentioned Bruce Linton before, he's the richest guy in the city, and he kind of really this Anybody not heard the story otherwise? You've not heard it, okay. We'll tell you the story because you've not heard the story. <laughs> Bruce Lincoln comes out to me and says, um, what's going to say to the city? And we'd had this prophecy from Ezekiel 37 about his boat and the Lyric come through. And um, I said to him, oh, are you a Christian today? I said, oh, do you believe God is today? I said, well, uh, why are you asking what God is saying to the city? He says, oh, I've never got to say to the city, what do you think? I said, well, this is the prophecy that's come through, Ezekiel 37, to the three verses. And he says, oh, that's a great idea. He says, it sounds good. And the, the prophecy was simply this, the city's days are better than the days behind it. And don't need a pop in the city. And it's an incredible history of economic prosperity. And um, I said, we can hear the rattling of the bones coming together, God's going to do something in this city. He says, oh, that's a great idea. He sold up his property in Aberdeen, he bought millions of pounds worth of property in Dundee. And um, Dundee's land value went up 10%, and Aberdeen land value went down 15%, and then the oil price hit, the guy made an absolute killing. What's interesting in retrospect to me is this that that guy discerned more about what God was doing than I did. Because yeah. he made a fortune off it. Solomon, remind me of Solomon. And yet he didn't even believe in God. What's beautiful about that, when you have this moment like that, is he wouldn't do it with all this God. Much the same way that Mary and us thought, what are you doing with all of this God? And the wise men were thinking, what are you doing with all of this God? The shepherds, what are you doing with all this thing? The amount of mystery that must have been in people's heads at the time of the birth of Jesus. Right? You can see all Jerusalem were puzzling them. What is going on? <coughs> yeah. What are you doing? A couple of years ago, I found a church over. I came down to London and been working with the church in London. And I heard that Bruce bought the building off of Eva, who wanted to sell it, and he kept the deal for all the charities. As a thank you for what God did for him. Even though he's a living God. 
What are you doing? Finding the good in the midst of all of the chaos that we see. Seeing what God is doing. And without dishonoring him, but choosing to honor him in those moments, stepping into that uncertainty in this middle space between it all being dependent on me and it all being dependent on God. And choosing to just toe this line and say, I'm going to plug into what you're doing here, Lord. The gift of discernment works a bit like that. I have a more story to play with this one. Let me remember it. Okay. Yes, it's this story. This is a very unusual story, which I'm going to wrap around to help us understand the difference between knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. I had um, somebody come up to me in my youth work many years ago. I think I've said this story before. And say, if, if you, don't, you can't tell me what, what happened to me when I was younger. I'm not going to believe in God and I'm walking out here. So I said, give me a minute. I was at the desk. And so I prayed to God help. <laughs> and I was sitting down in my office. And um, God said to me, they were sexually assaulted by a family member when they were, and he gave me the age. And he gave me the name, he gave me the family member. So for discretion, I'm not going to say who it was. And um, I, said, I said, I can't say that. A word of knowledge. I can't say that. How do you say that to somebody? That so and so in your family sexually assaulted you when you were this age. What if you're wrong? I remember saying, oh, what if I'm wrong? Like, if I just had a bad curry and thought you said something <laughs> and you didn't, what if I'm wrong? So, uh, like, now I need wisdom. Malcolm alluded to this here last week. Wisdom to know what to do with the knowledge. Because that sort of stuff can be very dangerous. And so I remember, I can't see that. What? I mean, how do you talk to God? What if I'm wrong? Right? What? That, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, that's another journey. So anyway, I, I just thought, well, I'll check to see if it's something that's already been dealt with. So I said, well, again, is this being dealt with? Is this out in the open? Like, you know, with your, within your family, do people know? Was it, you know, yes, yes, it was. So then I could be, well, I could be wrong, but normal. So anyway, she'll hit the floor, she couldn't believe it, like, how do you know? All that sort of stuff came out. And I thought, well, you did ask, and I prayed, you know, God's real, right? And, um, Anyway, that began a whole journey of journeys. Um, that's knowledge. That's wisdom. Question. What was God doing in the middle of that? Because God was proving himself to her. As if she's his judge. God was revealing himself to her? Yes. God was connecting a relationship for ongoing pastoral care. Yes. So discernment is different from knowledge. It's different from wisdom. It is the application of, of the knowledge of what God is doing in a moment. To understand the good that is taking place in that environment. To see the separation of evil from good so that things may be brought into a place of holiness rather than loosened into a place of profanity. God is at work discerning. So when discerning teaching plane takes place, it divides so that that which is moving into profanity is taken away and that which is bringing it into holiness. It brings communities into a place of wholeness and holiness. It brings people into a space of healing and restoration. It introduces Christ into the mix. Through discernment and the application of my presence and his presence together, the words of knowledge and wisdom applied bring good and wholeness into that. Discernment is the right application then. When um, the COVID pandemic hit, we decided to underwrite all of the salaries for the staff for three months with all of our reserves before Rishi Sunak announced his job attention scheme. 
and we put the YMCA on a nine month egg timer where it would have ceased to exist in nine months time after being in the area for 142 years. Knowledge told me when the YMCA would die. Wisdom would have told me not to do it. If you're going to make this organisation survive, you will have to cut the jobs, you will have to stop this, you will have to stop doing that. It's a bad decision to earn your own way salaries. But discernment told me what is right to do. You're in a battle. You behave like right, David. Pick up your snake and run up your head. Do you behave like Moses and pray and ask people to hold up your hands? Or do you behave like Elijah and tell your servants, where's your faith? Cannot you, cannot you see that the Lord is going to fight this battle for us? I've been in that very situation. I won't tell you the story, but simply to say, I had a moment where I could have chosen to fight, or I could have chosen to let go. Both might have been wisdom. Both had biblical reasons to say I should do this way, like when you hear a sermon preach about how to be like David and everybody thinks they've got to confront their giants by fighting them. And this was a giant in my life. And God said to me, clear as a bell, I've not made you to be a David in this, I've made you to be an Elisha. Step back and let me deal with it. <coughs> Discernment is different from the sin, which would sometimes take you in the wrong direction. Knowledge just tells you where you are. You need all three. You don't just need two. You need all three, which is why we are very body and not individuals. Therefore, we need one another. As we go through more of this, the gifts of the Spirit, we recognize the harmony that's needed. It's not all supposed to sit in the past there. But the reason why the Lord has fallen on all flesh, and that all the prophesy, and all have dreams, is that we need the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as a community, we do not do that gathering together, but as a community, so that the knowledge of God through the gift of the Holy Spirit might be present in our midst, and that we might know so that the wisdom of God might be present in our midst, sometimes on a person, often in community, and also to say what God is doing. Friends, God is doing so much in this community, and I get bound up because I've just taken the time. God is doing so much in this community. Um, I was asked this week if I would forward to a whole bunch of people who don't know Jesus a copy of my paraphrasing of the Beatitudes because they are trying to define what wholeness for the entire city looks like and how that carries through into their vision, place making, and community development across the entire city region. What I'm praying for is they adopt it. Because then the Beatitudes become the statement of wholeness for 400,000 people living in this community. Wouldn't that be awesome? That the culture of God is adopted as a place-making scheme for the entire community. As my wife taps her watch. I wish I had the time to tell you all that I think God is doing. But I'm so excited because I see him everywhere. And he's at work in businesses, and he's at work in hospitals, and he's at work in schools, and he's at work in homes. And it's like a revival, but we can't see it yet. And I just, I long to see the day when we see compassion as the name above the town. As we see kindness and hard work as part of the everyday moments where fear is a forgotten ocean and where hope is a profound experience for every man, woman and child that lives here. May we become a place like that. May we become a place like that. Friends, we are in an amazing time. An amazing season where the goodness of God is being seen all over our nation. Let us stop focusing on 
justly evil, calling it out. The discernment is the gift to see the good, not just the evil in these things, right? Anyway, it's supposed to be playing music now, so thank you very much. Father, forgive me for the time I'm taking, but Lord, help us. Help us get excited about what you're doing. Help us to see what you're doing in our children when we get frustrated as a parent. And help us to see what you're doing in our church when we get frustrated as people coming on sometimes to church. Help us to see what you're doing through the teas and coffees and through the, through the cleaning and through the music and through the pastor and, and through the community that we minister in. Help us to see the good in one another and to call it out and to highlight holiness where it truly is, not just where it is, where we are not doing things, but where we are. And Lord, give us your gifts that we may know, we may be wise, but we may discern so that we may step into the good that you're doing and come alongside you, Holy Spirit, and get excited for what you are doing in our community. Help us, Lord, to shine light, light, beautiful light, Christmas light in this community. That through the sparkling of our hearts and our eyes, a light with the power of God, full of the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit, that this community may know your light and your presence and your Help those that don't know you, like the Bruce Vincent of this world, to come along. Help them, even them, Lord, to be ignited and inspired by your words and what you're doing and what you're saying. And may they bring about your change and that you may advance the kingdom of God for people who don't know the king. Lord, because we want, we long to see a nation return to your name again. We long to see people hunger after Jesus and be interested in what he would have to say to them. We would long to see them come to know you, Lord, that all may be saved, and that all may find life in its abundance in you. Give us what we need, Lord, for today, and inspire us and fill us with boldness for the tomorrows. I accept in Jesus' name.
and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Amen. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. Uh, can I please see Angela and Graham and um, who else? Uh, Elaine and Tracy and everybody else who's involved in the recovery Christmas meal tomorrow. Let's see you all in the office for five minutes.